D. This is Biography. Grimm's Fairy Tale. What a lovely name, Grimm. She is a TV legend best known for feeding man-eating plants and cutting the heads off roses. What made Carolyn Jones so perfect in the role of Morticia was that wicked little sense of humor that she had. Wait till you see what they've got cooked up for you. She starred opposite big names like Elvis Presley and Frank Sinatra and was married to a man who would become one of the most powerful producers in television history. But behind the scenes, Carolyn Jones battled Hollywood typecasting. She was expected to be Morticia much of the time. She fought the ravages of cancer. And there were days when she just barely could drag herself out of the dressing room. And she never lost her love for life or her limitless ambition. She was great fun. And she was a very dedicated, very professional actress. She just liked working. Carolyn Jones wanted to be a star so badly she could taste it. She longed for the spotlight, the fame and the glamour, anything that would take her away from the only life she knew. She was born on April 28, 1930, in Amarillo, the business center of the rural Texas panhandle. Even as a baby, Carolyn seemed destined to be an actress. She and her younger sister were both named after their mother Jeanette's favorite movie stars. Carolyn is named after Carol Lombard, and I'm named after Betty Davis. Mother loved movies and music and that whole excitement of that kind of life. She and Carolyn both could tell true and untrue stories, and their imagination, they were really great. They had the same kind of personality, too. Sweet huggers, <laughs> outgoing peacemakers. But times were hard for the Joneses. Carolyn's parents had a tension-filled relationship, and her father, Jules, couldn't cope with the pressure of raising a family during the Great Depression. In 1934, he ran out on them, leaving Jeanette with no means of supporting her two daughters. She was forced to uproot the girls, and they moved in with her parents. Carolyn was a sensitive, intelligent child, and she had difficulty adjusting to her new home. Her grandfather would often frighten her with outbursts of temper. Soon she began suffering from chronic near-fatal asthma attacks, which confined her to her bedroom for weeks on end. I think out of that whole experience, she created her own world, you know, books, some records. She liked Danny Kaye, and she'd listen to his records, and Spike Jones. From our, our bedroom, she created, I called it the command post, she was inside and I was outside and we came together in the evening and she would read me stories and poems, a lot of poetry, taught me a lot. Like her mother, Carolyn loved the movies, but she was often too sick to go. Instead, she read every fan magazine she could find and fantasized about someday joining the hottest stars on the big screen. But even when she was healthy, Carolyn felt trapped by small town life. By the time she reached high school, she couldn't wait to get out of Amarillo. She had read about the famous acting school at the Pasadena Playhouse near Hollywood, and all she wanted was to study there. In high school, she wasn't a popular girl. She was obsessed with getting to the Pasadena Playhouse. She had a hard time finding people that could share that big part of her world. Carolyn may not have had many friends, but she had talent. She stole the show in class plays and won award after award in speech, poetry, and dramatic reading. In 1947, Carolyn's dream came true. She was accepted as a student at the Pasadena Playhouse, where many top stars had trained. Carolyn was determined to be its next success story. Her whole family was nearly as excited as she was. Her grandfather even agreed to pay her tuition. Carolyn's time at the Playhouse was everything she had hoped it would be. 
she was finally in her element, a place where everyone loved acting as much as she did. She enjoyed actors. She liked bright people. I think she was enamored with some of the glamour of showbiz, but she also didn't take it seriously. Quick exchange, sharp mind, uh, that was what excited her. Carolyn was a star student at the Playhouse, and during the summers, she performed with stock theater companies to supplement the money she received from her grandfather. After three years of hard work, she got her diploma. But she knew it would take more than acting skill to get good movie roles, so she gave herself a head-to-toe makeover. She even endured painful plastic surgery to make her nose glamour girl perfect. Now she was ready to tackle Hollywood. Not only did her Texas accent leave, but she began to hold herself in a different way. She was very happy. And she began to dress beautifully and uh, uh, just, just look very beautiful. The ambitious young actress soon wrangled herself a job as an understudy at a small local venue called the Players Ring Theater. There she got a lucky break. When the show's leading lady suddenly left to get married, Carolyn confidently stepped in. A talent scout for Paramount Studios saw her on stage. He was so impressed that he immediately arranged a screen test for her. They gave her a scene to read, uh, and she did it very well because she was a quick study. And I think what impressed them was that she'd memorized the line so quickly and pulled it off pretty flawlessly. And, and maybe that, more than the uh, power of her performance, got her the contract at Paramount. Carolyn was signed for six months. It was just what she had always wanted. She was now part of the studio system. But she still had a lot of Texas in her and couldn't always take Hollywood seriously. She found a lot of Paramount interesting, but a little on the ridiculous side, too. And when DeMille came in the commissary with the uh, boots and the, and the puttees and the, and the riding whip and, and, and all the gear, her inclination was to, to snicker at it. Carolyn was all business, though, when she made her screen debut in a small role in 1952's The Turning Point, starring William Holden and Edmund O'Brien. That certainly was the turning point. I was all that struggling, and there she was. I, I understand that our grandparents, my grandfather and grandmother, actually danced around the living room, and <laughs> mother cried, of course. It was, it was great. She was really good. We were proud. But Carolyn got only two more small parts at Paramount. By the time her contract was up, she was all but forgotten. With television coming on the scene, and there were many economy measures taken in that period of 1951, uh, as Carolyn said, she and 16 secretaries were let go. And uh, that's the reason she was out of Paramount. She hadn't made much money at the studio, but now she had no income at all. Her sister Betty moved in to help with the rent, and Carolyn scrounged for any acting job she could find. Ironically, she got work in the same medium that had put her on the street in the first place, television. Over the next two years, she sharpened her skills on some of TV's top shows, like The Millionaire and Colgate Comedy Hour, playing everything from an accused murderess to a movie siren. Carolyn also returned to the stage, working at Preston Sturgis's Players Theater in Hollywood. There, she fell in love with an aspiring writer and fellow Texan by the name of Aaron Spelling. They were very much alike, very in sync, it seemed to me. But they were like puppies, playing all the time. Carolyn and Aaron had a lot in common, talent, ambition, and a sharp sense of humor. They were adorable together. I mean, you couldn't be around them and not laugh and have a good time. It was always great fun. <laughs> 